Hi friends, welcome back. So now we are continuing our transition about showing you the new way of doing statistics. In JASP. Once again, the new way focuses on visualization, focuses on estimation, and most importantly, it emphasizes the general linear model. And by the way, in a future release of the visual modeling module, we'll probably have some more Bayesian stuff in there. Excellent, excellent, yeah. Huzzah! So to do that, let's continue with our existing data set back in JASP. All right, let's do some regression. So we're gonna start by looking at the income before. So we're just trying to predict what they had before the course even started, and then we're going to use hours. And again, all I did was I entered uh, the predictor that I wanted, and in the background, the linear modeling module figured out that this is a regression and it's gonna figure out what statistics to report. And just like we've done before, I'm gonna go down to results displays and I'm going to click on univariate. And I'm also gonna click on show p-values even though I don't like them. Um, just because, again, you might be required to get those. So, I'm gonna start down here. We've already looked at income before, but we also have hours. It ranges from negative something to 75. So we have people working negative hours a week. I wanna be those people. I want to get paid to work, and how do you work negative hours? So if we were looking at this and uh, this were our real data set, we would say, hey, there's something going on here. We got a problem. But um, I actually simulated these data, and that's just because I forgot to cap it at zero. So, But otherwise, you would uh, try to figure out why you're getting negative hours. So we've got quite a range of people working. Uh, so now that we've looked at the univariates, we can look at the bivariate graphic. And so we have a slope that is definitely not flat. So there certainly is a relationship and it makes sense. The more hours you work, the higher your income. And that's gonna be because of two things, I would think. Um, so some people are paid um, by the hour. And so obviously if you work more hours, you're going to get paid more. But also um, we're kind of tapping into the characteristics of the people. It takes a certain type of person to average 60 to 70 hours a week. Those people are what we would call workaholics. And so it's not surprising that workaholics are gonna make more money than people who choose to work 10 to 20 hours a week. So there's our graphic, everything looks nice there. Let's go ahead and go down to the model comparisons, which again is for hypothesis testing. There's a semi-partial R squared. Again, I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but that's respectable for psychological research but we will get into the semi-partial Bayes factor. So as with the t-test, the baseline model is the mean model, or in other words, it's going to predict uh, your income score using the mean of income. And so relative to a model that just predicts your mean income score, if it adds uh, hours as a predictor, uh, that model, the evidence in favor of that model is 500,000 times stronger than the evidence in favor of a model that just looks at the mean. So according to the base factor, we resoundingly accept the hypothesis that ours is an important predictor. And then we can get down to statistical significance if uh, the journal requires it or your supervisor or colleagues or whatever. And typically if you're doing just a bivariate relationship like this, you would report the correlation coefficient. So to report that in APA format, it would be R, open parentheses, 205, close parentheses is equal to 0.376, comma, P less than 0 0.001. And so that right there is your correlation coefficient. So it's 0.376. And if I remember my benchmarks correctly, 0.1 is considered small, 0.3 is considered medium, and 0.5 is considered large. So that's uh, uh, around a medium effect size. And then we get down to regression slopes and intercepts. And um, just like algebra, you had slopes and you had intercepts. Likewise, you do in statistics. So sometimes the intercept actually isn't all that interesting, but in this case, it is. So the intercept tells you the predicted value on Y or the outcome when your predictor is equal to zero. So our predictor in this case is hours worked, and so working zero hours is actually meaningful. So this tells you the expected salary if you worked zero hours a week. And holy moly, we have people making 48,000 even though they are not working. So some trust fund baby or something, I don't know. 
Uh, but I would like to be that person to get paid to do absolutely nothing. So in this situation, that is meaningful. Um, some situations it might not be, like if you have a Likert scale as your X variable, what does zero on the Likert scale even mean? Well, it doesn't really mean anything. It's an arbitrary scale. But in this, in this situation, it actually does make sense. And then we have hours, which is 0.377. So that tells you how much um, we expect the outcome to increase every time the predictor increases by one point. And so a one point increase in our predictor means you have increased the hours you work by one hour. And so this tells us that we would expect your salary to increase by $377 for every hour that you work. Now, does that mean that every single person in this sample is averaging $377 an hour? No. Again, like I said before, uh, this sample conflates hourly rates with the type of person that they are. So that $377 an hour um, has probably more to do with the fact that you have workaholics in here being combined with people who don't work very much. So that $377 is both the hourly rate and the characteristics of the people that we're kind of accounting for. Here are your confidence intervals and here's your standardized slope. Uh, and if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but I believe your standardized slope is always gonna be equal to the correlation coefficient. Uh, if there is one variable. If there's more than one variable, it's not going to be like that. But um, So you would interpret the standardized slope kind of sort of like a correlation coefficient. There's actually a more technical definition about uh, increases in standard deviations per increase in another kind of standard deviation, but I'm not going to get into that. And now we are going to do a chi-square for those brave enough to step into the world of chi-squareness. And we use a chi-square when we have a categorical predictor and a categorical outcome. Now this ends up being a little tricky because in just about all of statistics, we assume that the distribution of the outcome is normally distributed. Well, technically we assume the residuals are normally distributed, but don't worry about that. You're not going to get normally distributed data when your outcome is categorical. So in these situations, instead we have to use what's called a generalized linear model. And see the link in the description for more details on the generalized linear model. But we're gonna circumvent all that technical detail to just get right into it. So with that, let's go back to JASP. Now one thing about the linear modeling module is, is I really tried hard to think of a way to incorporate a chi-square analysis in the visual modeling module and it felt forced no matter what I tried to do. So there's not really a good way to compute statistics on it, but we can visualize that. So I'll show you how to visualize that real quick. So we're gonna click on visual modeling and then go down to flex plot. And remember a chi-square is for situations where you have two categorical variables. So I'm gonna choose one of them kind of arbitrarily as the dependent variable, one as the independent variable. And then we get a plot that looks like this. And so uh, we got on the x-axis the graduate status and then different colors representing the different groups. I don't know why that column uh, is labeled like that. Uh, that's probably either a JASP error or more likely one of my errors. I'll see if I can fix that before you guys get there. But anyway, uh, and then the y-axis here it represents a proportion, but it's kind of a unique proportion. And to help you understand what that is, let me just go ahead and give you an example. So let's look at this uh, little bar right here. So this represents um, college graduates uh, who chose to not attend either of the seminars. And so again, this is a proportion. So what does that tell you? So this tells you how this y-axis tells you how much we deviate from what we would expect if the two were independent. So in this situation, let's just round that off to five just to make it easier. So five percent. This tells you that we have 5% more college graduates who chose the control group than we would expect if there was no association between being a college graduate and which seminar you chose. Uh, so if the data were 100% completely independent, all these bars would have a height of zero. They would all be at zero and it'd be a very uninteresting plot. Uh, so let me look at the other one. And maybe we can start developing some hypotheses. Uh, so this green one right here that goes negative, so that tells us we have fewer college graduates in the Mo Money condition than we would expect if they were independent. 
And so let's just round that off to 15. So we have 15% 15, 15 fewer college graduates choosing the Mo Money condition than we would expect if they were independent. And that actually, if I were to develop a hypothesis, I would say, all right, that makes sense. If you're a college graduate, uh, one of the reasons why you go to college or one of the outcomes of going to college is you become a little more wary, a little more skeptical. These people might be a little more careful and worried about getting scammed. So if they see a seminar advertised with the name Mo Money, they might be a little suspicious of that. On the other hand, in the wealth building condition, we have, I don't know, maybe 7% more than we would expect if the two were independent. And again, that goes with our hypothesis that there's some credibility attached to the wealth building seminar that there isn't in the Mo Money seminar. But we could just be making a mountain out of a molehill because anytime this could just be noise that we're interpreting. There may not be really any detectable association between the two. And so in order to do a test and to get some statistics out of there, we're gonna have to go outside of the linear modeling module. And instead we're gonna go to frequencies here. And so we will start with under the classic uh, we'll select contingency tables, and this is how you would do a chi-square test. So you would select group in the rows and graduate in the columns, or you could put graduate in the rows and group in the columns, it doesn't matter. And then it shows you what's called a contingency table, so that 34 means that there were 34 people who were college graduates uh, in the control condition, 29 college graduates in the mo money condition, etc. And then at the bottom here we have our chi-square test. And so you would report this in APA format as chi-square, open parentheses two, close parentheses equals 1.577 comma, P is equal to 0.455. So according to the, to the standard statistics, we would say that is not a statistically significant difference and conclude that there is no association between graduates and whatever seminar they choose. Now it would be nice if we had some Bayes factors here. And we can actually do that by clicking on frequencies, and then we have the classical here, which is what we did before, but we could also use the Bayesian. And so, since we're looking for a Bayes factor, we could do a Bayesian contingency table. And then just as before, we're gonna click on group in the rows, graduate in the columns. And then now what it does is it gives us a Bayes factor, one zero independence uh, multinomial. And so what it defaults to is it uh, puts in the numerator the hypothesis that says that these two are associated, and in the denominator it has the independence model that says they are not related. And so we get a number less than one, which tells you that we are more inclined to choose the model that says they're independent. Now, how much more? Well, you could either divide um, that into one, or you could go into statistics. And then, so by default, it compares the full model to the reduced model, as we call it, or the model where they are related versus the model where they are unrelated. And instead, we can compare the model where they are unrelated divided by the model where they are related. And now that gives you a value that's a little easier to interpret. So the 11.9 says the model that uh, claims they are independent, the evidence in favor of that independence model is about 12 times stronger than a model that says they're associated. So that is the basics of how to do a chi-square test as well as a regression in the linear modeling module and in JAS. I hope you've had as much fun as I have. I know I have! And truly, statistics is fun when you do it with a general linear model approach. So with that, I'll see you in the next video where we are going to talk about multivariate extensions of the GLM. Until then... Death is 99% fatal to laboratory rats.